Good morning. I'm glad to be here. I hope you're glad to be here. I want to welcome you to Circleville Christian Church worship services for you here and those that are online. Just glad to be here. Pray that it'll be a good morning and being uplifted and encouraged. And this morning, I want you to look through your <clears throat> your bulletin. There is one about tomorrow evening for all for calling all women to come and paint, and they probably use all the help you, they can get. I'm going to also talk of the soup special. It's coming up November the 28th, following the church services that day. Uh, soup will be provided, but if you would like to bring something to help out with the other food, there's a sign-up sheet back in the foyer. Please fill that out. So be, be sure and look through all this and see what's going on, and, and I'll open us this morning with prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can be here this morning, that, you've, that we have the freedom to do that. I just thank you for each one who has a part this morning and pray your blessing on all that goes on here. Pray for those that, that can't be here this morning, that you would watch over them and with uh, the problems that they have, whether it's health or loss of loved ones or big moves in their lives, I just pray that you would guide them. I thank you for all those that... Uh, keep us safe and protect us for our military. I also pray for our missionaries that you would guide them as they preach around the world. Again, I thank you for each one here and what goes on this morning and pray that it is uh, to your honor and to your glory. In Christ's name, amen. Do nothing out of self selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every name should bow, knee should bow, and in heaven and on earth under and under the earth, and in every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Please stand with us.
Jesus is the only you weary come all you thirsty come to the well that never runs dry drink of the water come and thirst no more come all you sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for for God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with hope and arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated, now it is well. I'm walking in freedom for God so loved, God so loved the world. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. God so loved the 
world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever bring all your failures bring your addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross jesus is waiting there with open arms Jesus be the center be my source be my life Jesus This morning, I want to use as my first scripture, Galatians 3, 26 through 28. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, but you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, I guess you could say this morning that my communion meditation was kind of inspired by Lyle a couple of weeks ago, and Lyle talked about the promises concerning Christ and the prophecies concerning Christ in the Old Testament, and how all those people looked forward, and when they looked forward, they looked forward to that point in time when Christ came and lived his life and went to the cross in, in our behalf. So when I was listening to that, for some reason, I kind of remembered a book that I had read several years ago. The title of the book was Atheist Delusions, and it's by David Bentley Hart. He's a tremendous scholar on world history, and he takes some of those atheists to task for some of the negative things they've said about Christianity, and he shows through history that they're off track. So 
This morning, I want to focus on some of those things he says about Christianity in the Western world. He talks about in the Western world today the difference that we uh, see today in our society to that compared at the time of Christ. Uh, he talks about today with the freedoms, the abolition of slavery, economic opportunity, voting rights, equality, governments that have laws concerning justice for all. And again, it's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male or female, all are one in Christ. He points out that the Western world has been influenced for Christianity in a big way, even though there are times when we probably have failed somewhat. He talks about some of the charities and the love that have come about in the Western world because of the influence of Christ. And I thought about places like Habitat for Humanity, some of those that feed the homeless, uh, the Salvation Army, and even like in Topeka, God's Storehouse. All those things and a lot more are a result, at least in big part, from Christianity. <clears throat> he goes on, the author, and says if you could step back in time and take a, like a bird's eye overview of Christianity and the influences that it has had and, and run those backwards in time, he says it would come to a point, again, a point that comes back to Christ and how Christ's teachings and his going to the cross changed the world. So Christ changed everything through his sacrifice. My second scripture comes from Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, let us, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize in our weaknesses, is able to sympathize in our weaknesses, but has been tempted in every way just as we are yet was without sin let us then approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may find peace and mercy to help us in our time of need boldness to go to the throne of god that would be something that is almost outrageous to us but to a jew living at that time it would be even more outrageous but we can we have the ability to go to to god through christ's sacrifice so this morning, as we remember all the things that Christ has done and how history before and after pointed to him, let us remember that great sacrifice, the sacrifice of him going to the cross and shedding his blood for us. So this morning, I'm going to have a short time of silence. Then we'll uh, have a prayer and we'll take communion together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time and the things that we can remember that Christ changed in the world, not only in the world, but each of our lives through his shed blood. And I just pray your blessing upon this time of communion when we remember the things that he has done. Just pray your blessing on each one who partakes this morning, and I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. At this point in the service, uh, we'll be passing the community collection plate uh, here in the auditorium. If you're listening online and would like to give, uh, we would encourage you to look at our website. And uh, there's a place where you can give tithes and offerings. And I think I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, praise God for his goodness. Um, this week, we were able to pay off the remaining $170,000. Uh, over the last year, we've paid off $170,000 on the building over there. And we've completed our payments on that, and now it is uh, free and clear. So, um, amen. And, and, and that's through the goodness of God and his uh, generosity and the generosity of his people. So thank you.
Morning. Ooh, that's loud. I think you can hear me, don't you? Uh, for those of you who might not know who I am, I am uh, Kevin Ingram, and I have the privilege of serving uh, as the president at Manhattan Christian College, and uh, can't believe that I just started my 23rd year at the school. I, I know it's amazing. I'm probably only 41 years old, right? And I've been there 23 years. That's exactly not true. But uh, my 23rd year back at the college and my 16th year as president, and it is a privilege for me to serve in that role. And one of the many reasons is the many church partners who help us do what we do. And I just want to take this opportunity. I'm not here to talk about the college. I'm here to preach the God, God's word. But I just want to say thank you for your support, your partnership. I think I share this every time I come. Uh, the first church I visited when I moved from Alabama uh, to go to MCC back in January of 81, which was over 40 years ago now, uh, I was in a quartet, and uh, we, we went and traveled around America, uh, mainly, which means Kansas, America, mostly. Uh, the first church I came to visit was Circleville Christian Church, and we sang at a weekend, weekend revival. Ron Algren was the pastor, and it was just such a fun memory that I go back. I stayed at the Geist house for the weekend and got to meet that wonderful couple, and uh, it is just one of my favorite memories when I look back of Kansas on the journey of Kansas becoming my home. And I'm originally from Alabama, and you ought to be thankful I've lost my accent uh, because it used to be much worse when I was there. You know, when I go home, it goes back to that. But uh, I've now overcome that, as you can tell. And uh, Kansas is now my home. And it is because of, and many, many reasons, is the wonderful people of God who've welcomed me into Kansas. And uh, the Circleville Christian Church was one of the first ones who did that. So let me say thank you very much. I can't see y'all, so I can't ask you to raise your hands and say how many of you were here back then. And I'm sure there's some of you in the room who were here back then. You were probably in the nursery, right? But, you know, but that's okay. <laughs> we live in a well-lit world, don't we? I was in Orlando Monday through Wednesday for a... Um, for a meeting, and we were flying home Wednesday night, and the clouds, uh, in the first half of Dallas to Manhattan, the clouds covered, but when it broke, it broke right about Wichita. And you could see, I love it on a night flying into Manhattan, Kansas, late at night, because you could see, I could see Wichita, I could see Hutch. And uh, living in western Kansas for a while, it's fun for me to be able to look into the horizon and pick out a city and be able to know that that's Hutch, Kansas, that's Newton, Kansas, that's McPherson, that's Harrington, that's Abilene, oh, that's Salina. And it's really beautiful, and the reason we can is we live in a well-lit world. Uh, we have headlights, we have flashlights, we have traffic lights, we have night lights, we have lights on appliances. How many of you in the last week have used the light on your phone to help you find something? I know I have. Lights are getting more efficient all along. Slide, look at it, the evolution of light. It's interesting to see the, the way it went from fire, and thank God we don't live just by fire anymore or candle anymore or the lamp, and then Edison started a whole new world when he created the incandescent bulb, and Inman the, the fluorescent bulb, and Hammer, the CFL, and Hollenjack, the LED. What's in the future? Uh, I don't know, but this I do know. I don't want to live in a world without light. I don't want to live in a world without light. I don't want to go back to where it is just candles. And light, it's interesting, brings safety and comfort. I believe it brings safety and comfort as children. And let's be honest, it brings safety and comfort as adults. I thought about it a few years ago when I had the privilege of going to Africa with one of our alumni and speaking at a leadership conference over in Uganda. We went for three years, and one of the years that we went, uh, we went a little bit early. There was a couple from the church in Phoenix uh, that wanted to go, and we went a little bit early because they couldn't make the trip as quick as we had been making it. Uh, because if you want to know, it was a 37-hour travel day to get there and a 37-hour travel day to get back. And we would only be in country 54 hours and speak for three days and eight hours a day. And I've never slept so well on an airplane as you did after being on that quick of a trip. So that trip, we went a little bit early. And uh, the gentleman said, thank God, he said, why don't we do a safari for a few days? And since I'm the one needing us to be there that long, I'll pay for it. Praise God for that. It was wonderful. But I thought about light and how important it was because we were there, we landed at 11 in the morning and we saw lions and hyenas within the first 30 minutes off the plane. I mean, it was incredible. And we went to the camp and it was, we slept in tents and our tents were about 50 yards apart right on the bank of the Maasai River and didn't even think anything about being in Africa. I mean, it was incredible. And we walked the path and we went to supper and during supper, we didn't realize that we were having such a great time. It got dark outside. And all of a sudden you realize you're out in the middle of the Maasai Mara in Africa and there's no other lights other than 
flashlights. And it is pitch dark, and we had already started, we were sitting on the bank drinking a little, having a little snack in the afternoon, and a whole, I don't know what you call them, a herd, a gaggle, a group of baboons just ran right through the river in front of us. I mean, you're, it's incredible. And all of a sudden, we've got the farthest tent. It's about a 150-yard walk. It is pitch black, and we have a Maasai warrior who shows up with a spear and a flashlight and a big old machete on his hip. And I'm thinking, oh, good grief. That's all we have? You don't have a rifle? You don't have a pistol? We don't have a little golf cart with cages that we can drive over here? And he goes, no, just follow, you don't follow your warrior. I can tell you, my wife still accuses me of this, that I didn't worry about her. I just worried where the warrior was. I walked as close to him as I could. I mean, seriously, I'm like, he was here, I was right here. I mean, I was right on his back. I wanted the, I wanted the spear because we had already heard lions and hyenas and hippos, and elephants, at a 150-yard walk. It's one thing to walk through a cow pasture, but to walk through a jungle. And that light that he had meant so much. <laughs> the next morning we found out why, because we were also missing the animal droppings that walked through the tent at night so that we could, we could know where to walk and not step in something. But the light meant a lot. And when I think about our dark world, I think we have to understand that light means a lot. And it's not just the light physically, it's the light spiritually. And I want to go back and start in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And it says this, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. Man created the lights we have now, but light itself was actually created by God. From there, God created the rest of creation, and on the seventh day, he rested. And I heard an interesting thought from one of our students who shared at the beginning of the year, and just to let you know, the light of the world, being able to walk in the light of the world, living in the light is our theme for the year at MCC, and it's a great theme. And she shared this, and I thought it was so interesting. In the creation account, the seventh day was the only day with no beginning and end. Think about that. On all the other six days, at the end of the day, God saw that he had done, and it was good, and that was the end of the first day. And at the end of the second day, God saw that it was good, and it was the end of the second day. But the only day that did not cease in that passage outlining God's handiwork in creation. And she said, we can take from that this thought. God is actively ruling his creation. When he stopped on the Sabbath and started looking over all that he had made, God looking over all that he has made is still going on. It didn't end. We can be comforting to know that the God who created light is still active and in control. And then she said this, and he is seeking your heart. Wow, how profound. I think it's fascinating to think that that's the God we serve. And it's proven very specifically in the next in the beginning passage I want to read which in a special way also leads us to light. I want to read from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Listen to it. Verse 1, in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. You see, God is seeking our hearts, and even his own son was sent to bridge, the, to bridge that chasm, to bridge that gulf, to bridge that divide between him and each one of us. Jesus coming to earth and beginning, becoming a light to this dark world was the fulfillment of what God shared through the prophet Isaiah. And I want you to hear this because you begin to see God's eternal purpose and God's eternal plan as it is played out in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Listen to it. Hundreds of years before Christ came, Isaiah said this. I want to read verses 1 through 7. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. 
on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For in this day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, every warrior's boot used in battle, and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Then it says this, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. You see, Jesus was a light that dawned for those living in the land of the shadow of death. He is the light of the world. He is light of the world, and we need that light to navigate the darkness of this world physically. We also need his light to navigate the darkness of this world spiritually. And that's why God sent his son. His coming was a certainty. I love this passage. It talks about it in past tense. Verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You see, it's past tense, but Isaiah wrote it hundreds of years before. And I believe that is a tool in the Hebrew language that says, this is for sure. It is certain. Why? Because God's the one who planned it. And I think that ought to have great meaning for us as we're living in the darkness of the world we're living in. And we could take an hour right now and share all the illustrations of that darkness, couldn't we? We live in a well-lit world physically, but we live in a dark world spiritually. But that light that came years ago is the light that God had planned. And it tells us that this light was the light of men. Now I want to chew on that passage for a little bit. I want to go back to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and that's where we're going to dig in for a minute. I want you to understand what it says about Jesus Christ. And I so love that the communion meditation just ties in so well with this morning about what Christ came to mean. And I've got to be honest, I'll tell you this. I love it when that happens and it proves that God is a part of what goes on on a Sunday morning because he was at work in so many different levels this morning before we ever came together. Notice what it says about Jesus. For one, he was preexistent. Verses 1 and 2, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. The Word it is talking about is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, when it says, he, I, I can remember uh, hitting a point in my life when all along, when I was young in my faith and you know, in those early years, late elementary school, early junior high, when I thought Jesus was kind of plan B. The law, he tried the law, it didn't work, so i got to do something else. Uh, okay, we'll do this with my son. Oh, no, this was planned from the beginning. Jesus was preexistent. Colossians says in chapter 1, he was a part of the creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. He was living before creation began. He was with God and understands he was God. He is divine, and we see that in his work on earth. It just wasn't proclaimed in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It was proclaimed in everything that he did when you see uh, the healings that he did. And if we had time, I would love to hear your most incredible healing that he went through. When he healed the lame, he healed the blind, he healed the woman with a hemorrhage. And to me, that's one of the most powerful stories because he was walking through a crowd of hundreds, if not thousands, and people were reaching out to him. And she had faith enough just to reach out and grab his garment. And because she grabbed his garment, her faith was strong enough that it healed the hemorrhage that she'd had for years that doctors couldn't cure. But what's more incredible is that's how powerful he was. You see, he was preexistent. He is God. When he fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, now I'm amazed at every rural church dinner that I go to that how much food walks in and how much people eat, and there's always food left over. But to think about it, he took five loaves and two fish and fed 5,000. And there was more left over when they were done than they started with. Twelve baskets full, which I think is 
not, um, not an accident that the 12 disciples who said we need to send them off somewhere else to feed them were each holding a basket going, oh, yeah, we said we couldn't do this. And now I've got more in my basket than the little boy brought forward. This guy must be who he says he is. What about when he cast out demons? You see it in his work on earth when he calmed the storms. And even the disciples said, even the wind and seas obey him. You see, this light of the world is something that none of us could ever even fathom. The first verse starts with and the second verse ends with the same phrase, in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. And I don't think that's an accident either. Because you see, these men wrote down God's Word that God had spoke to them. 2 Timothy 3 tells us that. I think we need to understand in the beginning and it ends with in the beginning tells us that he was with God and he's been around all along. So when light was made, he was there. Verse 3 also tells us something powerful about Jesus. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. He is preeminent. The word preeminent means he is above and before others. He is surpassing. He is superior. There's no one like him. And I also love the restatement that occurs again in verse 3. Verses 1 and 2, it started within the beginning. It ends within the beginning. Verse 3 says, through him all things were made. Then it also says, without him nothing was made that has been made. So in case you don't understand what he's trying to say, not only did he make it, I want to say it a different way. Nothing was made without him. I think that was for men, right, women? We have to say it multiple times so that men understand things. Maybe that was for men to understand it. We want you to understand, not only did he make it, but also nothing was made without him. So make sure you're clear on that, guys. You got it? The point is clear, and Paul said it this way. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. You see, this is the one who is the light of the men that brings light to the darkness of our world. And praise the Lord, we can now say from verses 4 and 5, this preexistent, preeminent person, the Son of God, is now present. Verse 4 and 5. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness did understand it. I, I love it. You see, this life, this light, the light of men, shines in the darkness. And it was because he was now present. He had now come to earth. They were now proclaiming that this light of the world was now on earth. This Son of God, who was with God in the beginning, who is God, who joined in in creation, has now come to earth as prophesied in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. He's now here. John chapter 1, verses 6 through 9 says this. John the Baptist says, There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. And that's what John shared. That's what John the Baptist came to proclaim. The true light that gives light to every man has now come into the world. If you remember the Christmas story, that's exactly what Simeon confirmed. He was one of the ones who was in the temple when Jesus was brought in the eighth day. And Simeon said this, He took Jesus in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. You see, he's here. We have to understand that this light reveals God. He reveals God's power. He reveals God's heart. You know, when we see the passages, John 3, 16, let's go down the list, that say God is love, the best way that we see that is through His Son. He is love. He is now present, and He is seeking our heart. That's His purpose. God's purpose in sending His Son is to seek each and every one of our hearts, each and every one of us who struggle with the darkness of the world. There's a light that we find in Jesus Christ. 
You see, it reveals God, but at the same time, it also exposes sin. It exposes sin, it exposes darkness, it exposes chaos, it exposes motives, it exposes decisions, it exposes evil actions. Thank God it exposed animals in the safari. But you see, the light exposes all of that. Let's be honest, that's why the darkness doesn't like light. That's why darkness doesn't like truth. I read an article in Security Magazine as I was thinking about this sermon. The more violent crimes occur often at night. That doesn't surprise you, does it? They occur often at night, and I think it's interesting. John 13, 30, when Judas was left the last supper with the disciples to portray Jesus, what does it say? And it was night. See, what happens in the darkness? Something we think we can hide. And this light of the world comes to expose the sin, the darkness, the chaos, the motives, the decision, the evil actions. But this, understand, this light also provides love. This light of the world provides hope. This light of the world provides grace. This light of the world provides forgiveness. This light of the world provides peace. This light of the world provides guidance. This light of the world provides salvation. And all of that is wrapped up in the light of the world, Jesus Christ coming to earth. He provides comfort. He provides an example to follow in our lives. And his presence continues. Continues. And I think maybe part of our issue is I don't know if we fully understand this image of Jesus because we live in a world of light that is artificial light. We might appreciate it more if we lived in Africa with huts, with dim candles lighting the night for only a few hours before they burn out. We might appreciate it more if we lived in those huts and when we walked out of our hut at night, all we could see is the stars in the heavens and we don't have street lights that light up the corner and we don't have street uh, house lights that light up our yard and we don't have motion censored lights that when we walk by it pops on. Maybe we don't appreciate it. Because we rarely, if ever, wander in darkness physically, it maybe limits this image for us spiritually. But think about this. Spiritual darkness continues in our world, and I believe is even growing. Read passages, and that's what it says is going to happen. In the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, (laughs) lovers of evil, brutal, Arrogant, disobedient to parents. Timothy talks about that. We could go down the list. And when we live in this world, I think that darkness is growing. I'm amazed uh, by all the animosity that people are sharing with each other. I'm amazed that you remember the day when we could talk to somebody civilly about something we disagreed on and now we can't even do that? You remember those days? How many neighbors are no longer neighbors even though they live right next to each other because they have a disagreement? How many churches are now fighting over mask and no mask and vaccine and no vaccine and the political standing of where everybody is? How many families? I've heard of families that have exploded because of that. But understand this. His presence continues to help us live as children of light in a dark world. And our world needs that light so badly. Maybe you know exactly where I'm going next. Our world needs every believer in this world to live in the light and walk as children of light. Because that's what's going to help change the world is when we walk as children of light, and when I say light, we're walking as children of light with a capital L, and that is we're walking as children who follow the light of the world and share his light with this dark world that we're living in. We need that light badly to navigate the darkness of the world we live in ourselves, and maybe there's an analogy here with a safari. We had the safari and the light to help illuminate lions that might be roaming around at night, And we need that light in our lives to avoid Satan, who Scripture says is prowling about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So here's the challenge this morning. Walk as children of light. 
walk as children of light. And I don't want you to be the light that just goes around and goes, okay, there's darkness, I'm popping my light on. There's chaos, I'm popping my light on. There's hatred, I'm popping my light on. I want us to be children of light, and there are times where we have to expose darkness, but I want us to go in and reveal Christ and reveal His love and His grace and His mercy and His peace and His comfort and His hope. That's the children of light we need to be. People who go in and say and share, and I I think it's fascinating that in John it also says Jesus came full of grace and truth. Problem is, so many believers are going around only sharing truth and they share no grace. Then there's a whole other set of believers who are only going around sharing grace and not pointing out any truth. But we need to reflect the light of the world and come with grace and truth, just like he met with a woman caught in adultery. And they threw her before him, and they, they were saying all the different things about her, and they were like, you know, in the law it says that we should stone her. What do you say? And he started to write in the sand, and I'd love to have known what he wrote. Wouldn't you? It'd be a great communion meditation, wouldn't it? Man, what did he write? And he just simply said, any of you who can, hasn't sinned can cast the first stone. And then he wrote in the sand some more, and he looked up, and there was nobody left. And he said to the lady, where are your accusers? And then he said, you know what? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. She knew the truth. And what she needed was grace. Neither do I condemn you, grace, but go and sin no more, truth. We need that. Our world needs that. Our families need that. Our schools need that. Our homes need that. Our businesses need that. Every one of our interactions need that. Walk as children of light. Another second dimension of this I think is so powerful because... um, I don't remember a time in my life where we have faced the ultimate darkness of the grave like ever before. At least from a physical illness that has hit so many people so differently. And and there was a week for me that was so poignant because uh, there was a week for me earlier in the year where both my in-laws, who are 86 years old, had COVID. Uh, Both of them have health issues. They were on every list that should have said it should have seriously affected them, but we didn't know they had COVID until my mother-in-law started having AFib, like she, she'd had a bout with that, like she normally has, and she went to the emergency room to get checked out, and they go, well, uh, by the way, uh, uh, you have COVID. We had no clue. My father-in-law, well, you better check out your husband. We went and got him checked, and he had COVID. We had no clue. That same week, we lost a 44-year-old alumni who's a pastor down in Oklahoma. Perfect health, but COVID took his life. I don't understand it, but this I do understand, that the greatest darkness that men face is the ultimate darkness of the grave. And not only did Jesus come to light our dark world, he also came to light the shadow of the darkness of death. And it did so through his son, Jesus Christ. In him defeating death, death has no victory, death has no seeing, sting, because God's son came to earth, lived a sinless life, and defeated death for us when he rose again. So the light that we walk in on earth, which we need to reflect, is also the light that we walk in in heaven, fully in his presence. To enjoy for all of life. So when this light of life brings hope and grace and mercy and forgiveness... At the end of our life, it also brings grace and mercy and hope and forgiveness. Praise be to God. So this morning, I hope it's clear. I hope my message has touched you in some way for us to remember that, yes, we're living in a dark world, but we're living in a world that has the light of the world, Jesus Christ, walking with us. And this light of the life was there before time ever began on this earth. This light of the life is preeminent to any other force on this earth because he is God's son. And how wonderful to know that this this light of life is now present. And he's still present with us each and every day. 
and he's seeking your heart. He's seeking your heart. He wants each and every one of us to have a relationship with him. He wants each and every one of us to walk in the light with him. And um, that's really what I ultimately want to close with. And I'm going to come down front and be close with you for a little bit. Since it's 5 till 12 on the clock back there, I probably ought to quit, don't you think? You know, <laughs> nobody changed that. It, it flashed in my mind. Oh, good grief, I haven't gone for an hour and a half, have I? <laughs> Truth of the matter is, he, he is seeking every one of your hearts. And I love traveling around the different churches and being able to see people and meet people because I'm an extrovert and I walk into a room for 100 people and I want to meet all 100. But when I go to churches that I, I come into, I, I'm only here, I think it was a few years ago I was here, Paul. How long ago was it? After, huh? 20. 20 years ago. I mean, you know, maybe after this morning you're thinking he doesn't need to come back for years again. I don't know. We'll figure that out. But March of 20, that's right. I thought you said it was 20 years. Man, okay, then March of 20. I didn't think it was that long ago. My memory's getting bad, but not that bad. Yeah. But I don't know what you're dealing with. That's one of the things I miss. Being a pastor in a local church and walking into the room and knowing what the people in the room are wrestling with, uh, their marital struggles, their children's struggles, their health issues, I don't know. So I don't know that side of it, but this I do know. There's a Savior of mankind who came to earth thousands of years ago, and he is seeking your heart. And this morning, regardless of what's on your heart, he is seeking your heart to minister to you, to love you, to help you, to give you grace, to give you mercy, to give you hope, to give you forgiveness, to give you strength. Whatever you need, he is here. And I would be remiss this morning if I didn't make it so very, very clear that he is seeking your heart. And he doesn't want you to walk out this morning without connecting with his heart, without connecting with his hope, without connecting to what he brings to this world. The light of the world, Jesus Christ, is here. So don't leave without talking to somebody if you say, hey, help me see the light of what's going on here, because he's here. Father, God, I thank you for the privilege of worshiping with your people. I thank you for the very special privilege of sharing the word of God, because it is the most incredible, important, eternal thing that's ever been written. And what's beautiful is it was written over thousands of years, and it was written by your Holy Spirit who was pouring into the men who recorded it. And Father, I just give that to you and I'm so grateful uh, that you're the one who has put that all into place. It's kind of neat to see that how in Genesis, the, the author of Genesis used the words in the beginning and the author of John used the words in the beginning and to think that your son, the light of the world, was involved in both beginnings. Father, your son's going to be involved in the beginning of eternity as well. And I pray that this morning that your son who is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, who is just a full expression of you, what teach, touch each heart that's here in the special way that each heart needs it. The darkness that resides in each of our lives may be from different areas, but Father, may the light of the world bring light to that darkness and bring hope. And I give that to you and ask for your Holy Spirit to be involved in the lives of each and every one of us this morning so that as we leave this place, the darkness that's in our life is illuminated. And that, Father, as we leave this place, you would use us all the other days of this week and this month and this year to illuminate the light of the world to the world who needs it so badly. In Jesus' name, amen. for